And I have to admit that John chapter 7 is uh, a somewhat difficult uh, chapter because it contains so much of the words of Jesus in the midst of a debate about who he is. The Jewish leaders, of course, are in contention with Jesus about him being the Messiah. They did not want to accept that he's the Messiah. And Jesus is trying to explain to them mainly that he has come from God and that God the Father sent him. He says that over and over. It must have been a challenge for John to actually record this. If this was an ongoing uh, conversation. So I'd like to begin with verse, um, let me get the right chapter here in my Bible. Here we go. With verse 25, John chapter 7. Now some of them from Jerusalem said, Is this not he whom they seek to kill? But look, he speaks boldly, and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? However, we know where this man is from. But when the Christ comes, no one knows where he is from. Then Jesus cried out. And I think about the words there. It says Jesus cried out. He must have raised his voice even somewhat. As he taught in the temple saying, You both know me and you know where I'm from. And I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. But I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me. And he's all speaking of the Father there, all through that. Therefore they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. And many of the people believed in him and said, When the Christ comes, will he do more signs than these which this man has done. Now in the interest of time, I'm going to stop reading right there, but we'll be speaking um, from the rest of the chapter and, and we can look at various verses there. In church one Sunday morning, a stranger walked in the door and sat down in one of the pews behind a couple of ladies. And so one, they noticed him. One lady leaned over to the other lady and whispered, who is that? And she said, I don't know. And so the man heard them ask that question. So he leans up and he says, I am John Doe. And so he sits back. And in a little bit, one of the ladies whispers to the other lady, who is John Doe? And so I notice that when we meet someone new, we often like to connect them with somebody we already know. Who's their mother and dad? And you know, I do that a lot by the last names. When I hear the last names of a younger person, if it's the last names of someone I know, for instance, on the mountain, I might ask myself, is that their son? And so we have a concern in our country about being identified. Who are we really? And so I don't understand, Grover, why when we get on the plane, I just can't tell them, I am Randy Costner. And they say, good, good to know that. Go on. Well, no, you can't say that. Well, you can try that, but it's not going to work. Neither will it work for the police officer who just pulled you off for going 35 in a 15 mile an hour zone, which happened to me a couple of weeks ago. And so he comes up and what he don't ask me, who am I? He asked me if he could see my driver's license. And my and in fact, this one time I got pulled over a couple of weeks ago. He didn't even ask for my driver's license. I was pretty amazed. He asked if I was a bus driver. <laughs> I think he remembered me. 
from being in Kaiser? And I said, yes, I'm a bus driver. And he says, uh, you're all good. And turned around and got back in the car. And that was it. I attribute that mostly to my looks. I, I, I think he took a, a good look at me and said, that guy's all right. So right now, even in my pocket, I carry a driver's license. I got a social security card with me. I have my ministry ordination card. They got to believe that. Graver's got your name on. <laughs> now that's pretty good. And then I have a credit card. And once in a while, if I'm going on foreign travel, I have a passport. And all these things together hopefully tell people who I am. In addition, I have been fingerprinted for some occasion. I can't remember exactly when or why. I don't think my DNA is recorded anywhere that I know about. So I don't think that's happened. In the time of Jesus, they were trying to identify who Jesus is. And my Bible entitles this section of Scripture, Could This Be the Christ? Even though he is the Messiah that is long awaited, and promised in the Old Testament, which these Jewish leaders should have been very well versed on, they still have a problem with identifying Jesus as the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah that the people are waiting on. Now, Jesus identifies him here in this passage I read as coming from the Father. Verse 29, I know him. For I am from him, and he sent me. Jesus was born by the Holy Spirit, as the Father had willed, and Jesus came to earth. For many, this testimony was not enough. Even though they knew he was born in Bethlehem, they also had predictions in the Old Testament about him being born in Bethlehem. For many... The testimony and all the things that Jesus said here in verses 28 down to 29 was not enough. What do we require to believe something? I mean, someone might tell us something, and what do we believe it right offhand? I found that more and more I am suspicious of what people say. And if I see a person putting on a magic show, for instance, and he does something that looks very phenomenal, I won't believe it, that it actually happened the way I see it. So I'm very suspicious. I don't believe he saw the person in half. And if I hear some kind of bizarre story, and I've heard a few, especially in Kaiser. Let me tell you, there's a lot of stories that have a, a long history to them. They've been, you know, you can tell somebody something so much that they'll actually believe it, no matter what. But I won't believe a lot of stories. For instance, I've heard there's a Taco Bell coming to Kaiser. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. Don't take it from me. But they're digging up a lot there, and people have told me, on the bus, that that's where the Taco Bell is going to go. Um, it's all right with me. I believe it when I see it. And I don't believe at all that a lot of the things I read on the computer. Oh, you talk about a place to be weary. You can find anything there almost. And I'll run out and tell Christy something I've just found on the computer. And the first thing she says to me, where would you get that from? And if it came from Facebook, look out. Anything can write, anybody can write anything there. And how about advertisements? Oh, my goodness. I don't believe all the claims that some of these advertisers make. The Jewish leaders seem to have an unfounded suspicion that Jesus was not who he said he was. And some Jewish, uh, Jewish people would ask various questions. And they would ask, um, comparing him to a possible Messiah. In verse 32, the Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him, 
And the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officials to take him. And Jesus said to him, I shall be with you a little longer. And then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and find me and not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. And so in verse um, 31, and many people believed him in and said, when the Christ comes, will he do more signs than these which this man has done? So that caused me to think, what did they want? What more could we want in a Savior besides what Jesus is? What more could we want? More miracles? Would we believe in him if he did more miracles than he actually did? How about more teaching? Could we say we don't have enough teaching to believe that Jesus is the Christ? And we need more, more teaching? How about more people raised from the dead? Did he not raise enough people from the dead? And we would say we would believe he's the Christ if he raised more people from the dead. And what about a different crucifixion? What about seen by more people? Scripture says that the risen Lord was seen by more than 500 people at one time. And we have no record that any of them uh, changed their testimony of seeing Christ. What more could any possible Savior do than what Jesus has done? And I have to say, I don't need anything more to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. I have the written word of God here. I have the gospels that reveal his life as he lived it on earth and his teachings. I have enough to believe that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. And I have, besides all that, I have my own personal experiences with Jesus. I have seen his hand, not only in my life, but in the lives of other people. And I take that very seriously. Now, Jesus proclaimed his resurrection here, actually in verse 33. I shall be with you a little longer, and then I go to him who sent me. You'll seek me and not find me, and where I am you cannot come. Now, the Jews didn't understand that at all. Where does he intend to go? They're thinking he's intending to go to the Gentiles at that point. Someplace on earth. They're not even thinking about his resurrection. Jewish leaders could not understand, it seems, the very things that Jesus tried to tell them. Jesus proclaimed to be the water of life. And so in, on down in verse 37, on the last day... That great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. You know why he said that right there? It's because in the festival of the uh, tabernacle, they would bring water from the pool of Siloam into the temple and pour it on the temple floor. And each day for seven days or six days, they would bring that in and pour it on the temple floor. There are some people who think that he could have been standing in ankle-deep water at that time. But on the last day of the, the Feast of Tabernacles, they stopped bringing the water in. And so Jesus makes this claim. Now that is in commemoration of the water that came out of the rock in the Old Testament in the wilderness. That's what they are commemorating there. And Jesus stands basically and says, listen, I'm the rock and I'm the water both. And they didn't even pick up on that. And so Jesus proclaims himself to be the water of life. There is much division in this place about who Christ is. And one says he's a prophet. One says he might be a, a teacher. One says something else. Was he from Galilee? Isn't he from Bethlehem? 
Isn't his father Joseph? All these things, they're acting themselves, and they can't not agree. Today, the chief question I need to ask you is what is your decision about Christ? Who do you believe that this man is? Not who he was, but even who he is today. Is your faith strong to believe that Jesus here, who is trying to make his case to the Jewish leaders about who he is, at the same time, he's making his case to us about who he is as we read this scripture. Chapter 7 doesn't get a lot of attention. It's hard to outline, you might say. But there's a lot in it along the way. The most important decision you will ever make in your life is who is Jesus? And will you accept him as your Lord and Savior? Now we look at life, lots of decisions. None are more important or compare to that one decision. My prayer is sincerely that every person here knows Christ as Lord and Savior. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I see confusion in the scriptures here among these leaders who could not or would not accept that Christ is the Messiah. They had all kinds of motives for not accepting him. They didn't want to lose their position. Different things were affecting them and they would not proclaim Christ as the Messiah and Savior. Thank you, Lord, that in our day here, with Scripture, with the evidence of the Holy Spirit in our own hearts, we can know and be sure that Christ is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. He died and rose again and lives today interceding for us and soon he will come receive us to himself i thank you for this kind of knowledge and faith we can have in christ our lord in jesus name we pray amen